Amen. Okay, I'm going to read a few scriptures, um, not related particularly to the second coming, but related to seeking God for wisdom for these the days in which we live in. First one, James 1, chapter 5. James 1, verse, chapter 5. No, verse, James 1, verse 5. If any one of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach. And it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. Let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. We're living in a situation today where we need wisdom from God. Our political leaders need wisdom. And uh, the source of wisdom which James tells us is God himself. And he tells us to ask from him, and he would tell us, and we receive and know what we should do. Second scripture is 1 Chronicles chapter 12, verse 32, where it says, The sons of Issachar, who had understanding of the times, to know what Israel ought to do. And the third one is from Acts chapter 17, concerning Paul going to the Bereans, who were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. Therefore many of them believed. They had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. We need to have understanding of the times we live in, in order that we might know what to do. And we need to find that understanding from searching the scriptures, finding out whether these things are true, and believing the scriptures, believing what God says to us. And those who seek God and his word will build their house on the rock of faith, not on the sand. Matthew 7, verse 24 Jesus said, therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. I believe we're actually looking at signs which are leading to the fall of our civilization. It's built on the sand. What's going to stand in the ti- that time is actually what is built on the rock of faith and obedience to Jesus. And when the storm comes and the rains descend and the floods come and the winds, winds beat on the house, the house that's built on the rock is going to stand. If it's built on the sand, it's going to fall. And we have a choice to make to build our house on the rock of faith in Jesus the Messiah. And the last scripture at Hebrews chapter 12, verse 26. His voice then shook the earth, but now he has promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not only the earth, but also heaven. Now this yet once more indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken, as of things that are made, that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we're receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, Let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. We're going to come through this time. We're going to need wisdom from God. You can ask him for that. You're going to need to understand the times we live in so that you can know what you and your family and your church should do. You can ask God how to do this. And you need to search the scriptures daily to find out if these things are true. Ask God what they mean. And you need to build your house on the rock of faith and build your house on a kingdom which cannot be shaken. And if you believe in Jesus, you're actually in a kingdom which cannot be shaken. Everything else can be shaken around you, but this kingdom of God cannot be shaken. It can be troubled, it can be attacked, it can be under tremendous attack from the world outside, but it's going to stand. And in the end, those who stand for Jesus are going to be the ones who have that eternal reward with God in heaven. And so we have a world which is being shaken right now. We see the world in shaking process, shaking in process. We see the signs of the second coming as the woman in labor, as Jesus said it would be, uh, the distress of nations and perplexity, as he spoke about. And we see that it's leading towards a time of great trouble on the face of the earth, which will be preceding his return to the earth. And in that situation, he asks us to build our house on a rock which cannot be shaken. He also tells us that in the midst of all this, if you believe in Jesus, you have the blessed hope, the hope of Jesus returning. And I hope you have that hope, because there's no other hope. So when I did my talk on the hope for the future leaflet, 
If I didn't believe that Jesus was coming, I'd call it no hope for the future. But Jesus makes all the difference. If you have a hope in Jesus, you have a tremendous hope for the future. And a passage which <coughs> I'm sure we all know, but uh, I'll read again in Thessalonians chapter 4. Paul says, I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. If we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Thus we should always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say sudden peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them, as labour pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. Therefore let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober, those who sleep, sleep at night. Those who get drunk are drunk at night. But let us over the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and as helmet the hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Therefore comfort each other and edify one another, just as you also are doing. I'll read that scripture because I'm going to tell you a bit of bad news in a moment and some bad things which are going to happen, but that is also... The good news, that's going to happen to you if you believe in Jesus. One day you're going to be taken to be with him. Uh, since I believe in the pre-tribulation rapture, that could be at any time. If you take the other view, you've got to go through the tribulation first. But uh, I believe that the scriptures do tell us that we were not destined to wrath, but we are children of light, saved through the blood of Jesus to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. And the important thing is that we have obtained that salvation, we have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, so that we're ready for that great day when Jesus comes. And if you do that, no matter how much bad news Tony Pierce tells you about tonight, you have a future and a hope, and you have a lot of things to look forward to, wonderful things to look forward to when Jesus returns. Okay, so what about what's happening now? Now, I said earlier that uh, you need to search the scriptures to find out if these things are true. You need to learn from God. You need to understand the times to know what to do. And you need to teach others this thing as well. We live in a time when leaders in the church, as well as leaders of other faiths, and leaders in politics, to be honest, are doing none of these things. As a result, for the most part, they are blind leaders of the blind, uh, leading others and themselves into a pit from which there is no escape. And I do say the church advisedly, I mean the nominal church, the church outside of the true believers in Jesus Christ, but which is the majority church. And Isaiah, a passage in Isaiah is quite interesting, in verse 50, chapter 56 of Isaiah, verse 9. He speaks of Israel's watchmen, its prophets, its spiritual leaders, and he says, His watchmen are blind, they are all ignorant, they are dumb dogs, they cannot bark, sleeping, lying down, loving to slumber. They are shepherds who cannot understand, they look to their own way, everyone for his own gain from his own territory. They are dumb dogs, they cannot bark. Uh, what's the point of that? Uh, we're actually talking about a watchdog. If you have a watchdog, the watchdog is there to bark when danger comes so that he can protect his master's property. If the dog doesn't bark, then the danger will come and the property will be taken and the, it'll become a, a, a unexpectedly. His job is to alert his master so he can defend his property. The blind, dumb watchman doesn't do that. They look to their own way. And I would say what we have a lot of uh, in the church today is what I call Christianized humanism. Basically, it's Christianity or humanism with a little bit of Christianity added into it, rather than Christianity with a bit of humanism. It's humanism first and foremost, looking to humanism as the answer. If you hear some of the, quot the quotations from leading religious figures, from the Pope, the Archbishop of Canterbury, and other leaders of the church, you'll find that they're giving you some kind of a humanistic method, message. You've got to do good and try and work, save the world from all these disasters which are coming and do good for the world. But leaving out 
the basic point about the gospel, about sin and repentance, and about the second coming of Jesus the Messiah. And leaving out also the prophetic word, because if you take out the prophetic word, actually, what is our direction? How can we know where to go? Unless we take heed to the word of God. And lacking wisdom, they're like uh, our political leaders as well, who are like waves of the sea, being driven and tossed by the wind. And the wind is actually pushing the ship towards the rocks where it's going to sink. And sadly, I have to say that when we look at our society today, there are so many things which are pushing it towards that uh, kind of disaster area. There are some voices raised up to all of the danger, and not by means all, any, all of them are Christians. Sometimes the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. And I'm going to quote for one or two people tonight who are, I think, on the right track, but they're not Christians, but they're telling you actually what's happening and how, what to do about it. Uh, the wind to destruction is being driven mainly by, driven by the mainstream media, educational system, much of the visible church, the medical establishment, uh, politicians, who for the most part are not really in control. And behind this are all kinds of globalist forces like the World Economic Forum, the UN, International Monetary Fund, Big Tip, multinational companies, organisations which often have far more money and clout than nations, and which have a growing control over politicians, over banks, over finance houses, and are pushing us towards uh, <clears throat> what I'm going to tell you in a moment is the final situation of the end times. Look at our government, Boris Johnson, President Biden in America, EU leaders, Ursula von der Leyen, Macron, uh, Angela Merkel in Germany. Are they in control or are they being pushed? Are they pawns in the game or are they making the decisions? Are they actually really in control of it? Now, one of them actually may emerge as the king, the Antichrist, taking control of the ship in the coming tribulation. But we're seeing people behind the scenes who are probably making more of the decisions. 